Welcome to the Huddle Up Podcast, your go-to show for all things Broncos. Once again, Broncos country, it is time to huddle up. I am Carl Dummler, and with me as always, we have Nick Kendall. This show's focus is all things that pertain to your Denver Broncos, with an extra focus on the NFL draft. With Chad and Luke rejoining us on the Huddle Up, Nick and I will continue to talk general Broncos news, but we'll be much more draft-heavy in our content because building teams in April is arguably as fun as the actual games on Sunday, in our opinions. Follow myself on Twitter, at Carl Dummler MHH, as well as follow Nick, at Nick Kendall MHH, and add us as much as you like, and follow the, the podcast account at, at HuddleUp underscore MHH. We are active on social media and love to talk prospects and Broncos. We know you listeners are as football and Bronco crazy as we are. So please give us a click and a subscribe to us on iTunes, as well as iHeart, Stitcher, and Speaker. And don't forget to share us on Facebook and Twitter. We wouldn't be here today without you listeners. So please take the time to rate and subscribe to let your voices be heard on how you enjoy the show. This week, Nick and I are wanting to take some time to deep dive into the Broncos draft picks. We are hoping to bring something a little bit new to the picture to show you what these players had to do to get to this point and maybe a bit more of the mental makeup of the player themselves. Nick, are you ready to uh, dive deep into these players? Well, yeah, in between uh, work today, I've watched a little bit of film, you know, reading a little bit about the the bios of the players. You know, some people are ready to move on from the draft class, but I'm not ready yet. I mean, we still got a couple days until the rookie mini camp and we're kind of in the quote unquote dead period of the football season right now but there's stuff to talk about and just how all these guys kind of fit in the roster so I'm excited to really dig into the mental makeup and how they all fit for the Denver Broncos no I agree and that's you know when I was getting ready for all this and writing all these notes and everything else it was actually kind of fun just reading some of the backgrounds of these players and understanding their their history of how they've gotten to this point you know what makes them click I, you know, I think teams look into that a lot more than, than us fans ever realize. And there, there's some exciting things about these players, you know, some things that help give them a little bit of an edge or a little bit of a drive that um, maybe we just didn't know about before. So, yeah, I'm excited to dive deep into these guys and see what they bring to the table. Yeah, me too. And I'm excited to watch their personalities unfold on the field as well. I don't really see any, you know, Talib chain yanking kind of guys, but we got some dogs on there. So, I mean, it's going to be fun, and I'm excited to hear about the training camp battles. Yeah, and maybe the best story of any of our Bronco rookies is that of Garrett Bowles, our first-round pick, an offensive tackle from Utah. Now, offensive tackles usually are not the most uh, exciting or sexy pick or whatever you want to call it. I know there's a lot of Bronco fans out there that are pretty down on this. Uh, there's a lot of panic after after day one of the draft, and – I think you and I were kind of celebrating. We were kind of hoping that this would be the move. Well, if you guys have been following along to Carl and I in the draft podcast here for the last, you know, two months, we've been banging the table for offensive line. You know, it's not the sexy pick. It's not the one that's going to put up fantasy numbers, but it's what's needed to lay the foundation for this team, not just this year, but the coming years. I mean, you have to address that offensive line. And they finally did it. They got a guy that, I mean, just reading comments today from, uh, some of the, the guards, the veteran guards, Leary talking about him saying Bowles is a grown ass man and he's, he's going to bring a lot to the table. You know, he's going to be a little bit raw technically. We'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into him here, but I'm, I'm excited about him. And this is definitely one of the guys that I was hoping we'd go with round one. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and it, this is a, a little bit of a, a potential pick compared to finished product. Like you said, he's a little bit raw and uh, well, let's just dive into some numbers here before we really get too deep into his whole story, but he's 6'5", 303 pounds, 297 pounds. I've seen numbers kind of a little bit of everywhere. He's pretty on the light side for an offensive tackle, but he has 34-inch arms, which I know that's something that you look into a lot for the offensive tackle position, and 9 and 3 eighths inches for his hands. Looks like he's going to be wearing number 72 for the Broncos. I can't remember who was the last one to wear 72 for us. I cannot recall off the top yeah. of my head. Huh. But maybe he'll be that one that just retires the number. Let, let's hope for that. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, his combine numbers, we'll dive into that here a little bit because this is this is kind of what got him on the, the radar for a lot of people. You know, we were already talking about this guy for a long time before this, but he went out and had one of the better, maybe probably the best combine 
of any of the offensive tackles in this draft is he ran a, a four nine five forty. Anything under five for an offensive tackle is phenomenal. You know, that that's an athlete. That's somebody that can run. You got a 28 inch vertical, 115 inch broad jump, uh, 7.293 cone drill, and 4.55 20 yard shuttle. And I know that that's a lot of numbers, and maybe you're kind of going, what's the big deal? What do these numbers even mean? And I, I want to take a little bit of time because we're going to, all these prospects for the next two episodes, we're going to be talking a lot about these kind of things and some different numbers being thrown out there. And I just wanted to take a little time here to explain what do coaches look for in all these things. And, you know, you got the 40 yard dash. This is the, the, um, the top of the chain for everybody watching the, the combine. You know, we had John Ross break the record, 4 2 2. Wants to challenge Usain Bolt to a 40 yard dash. Yeah, that's not going to work out well for him. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Usain Bolt, I mean, it's the 100 meter where he is. I could see that 40, uh, 40 yard dash being, because it's much more about that early get off. And I thought I saw a side by side where they kind of like, you know, put the put them uh overlapping each other and ross was right there for that first 40 yards okay well i saw the other day they did i think it was uh one of the top sprinters in college track right now and uh they had him do a 40 yard dash and he ran a 412 oh my god yeah <laughs> yeah it That's was incredible and that was actually like machine timed it wasn't hand timed so uh, pretty 412 412 you'll have to look that up it was pretty impressive. He's going first next year. Yeah. He's going first in the draft. <laughs> there you I go. I don't even know who it is. <laughs> no. Yeah, he'll go win that island. That's all he's got to do, show up and yeah, win the right? island. <laughs> but anyway, so 40-yard dash. This is what they're looking for. It shows acceleration. A lot of times coaches will even talk about they're looking for that 10-yard split because that shows that first step. Like how does how do they explode out of there? And it, and it shows speed. Um, for offensive linemen, I've heard a lot of times that they're saying that they almost kind of wish they wouldn't even run it because it doesn't show a whole lot for them. This is more for the skill position players and secondary, because they're the guys that are actually going to be running some of these 40-yard plays, uh, you know, 40 or beyond. And you have to see that kind of long speed that comes up with the 40-yard dash. But still, I mean, like I said, with with Bulls, 4.95, that's pretty impressive still. Yeah, and it turned up to be the 95th percentile of the offensive tackles at the Combine. So, I mean, that's that's super elite. And you can see it on tape. He is no problem moving, even at 300 plus pounds. He measured it at 297 at the combine, but I'm guessing he probably played about 310 uh, this last year. He'll probably get up to 315, 320 this year, or the you know going forward. And that's just that's incredible. I mean, it's obviously you know how often is he going to be running 40 yards? Maybe we can get some uh, put him at tight end, get him in the screen game a little bit. That'd be fun. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, do a little forest lamp screen play. Like exactly, did, uh, exactly. His, his bowl game. Um, anyway, then the next one we have is the twenty-yard shuttle. This is this is actually kind of important for a lot of offensive linemen because this is moving sideways, getting that lateral movement going, showing agility, that ability to change direction in a in a hurry, uh, foot quickness. You know, all those things that are really good for an offensive lineman. And again, this is one where uh, Bowles did really well. He you know finished top five for offensive tackles. Um, you know, just Again, he's he's an athlete. There, there's no getting around. He was the best athlete at the offensive tackle position at the combine. And if you can can mold that into something, you know that that's the big thing. Is this is where coaching uh, with Davidson, our, our new offensive lineman hire, um, this is going to be huge. If he can mold him into something, we could have something big here. And then we have vertical jump. This measures lower body's ability to explode. I was a little shocked by. Bulls didn't do very good on this one, at least compared to other offensive tackles. Yeah, he was in the, uh, but it looks like the 49th percentile. So, I mean, just about, you know, top of the bell curve for the statisticians out there. But I'm, I'm actually pretty surprised too. I figured given his size, he'd have a better vertical jump. But when you put it in context with the rest of his athletic tests, I'm not too worried about it. You know, his spider graph isn't all the way across the board, nine, uh, above 85 percentile on the athletic tests, but still overall just a great athlete. Yeah, exactly. And then we have the the broad jump, and that measures, again, that kind of lower body explosion and and balance. And and this is why, again, why I was a little surprised he didn't do better at vertical because broad jump he did amazing. Yeah. You know, he, he jumped off the charts on this one. So, you know, again, I, I think he has good – 
lower body explosion. You can see it on tape. That's where he gets a lot of his power is by having that speed really transfer into to power. So I, I'm not too worried about that one at all. Yeah, I'm not too worried about that one either. I mean, he's he just he does show good explosive strength. It's more about that sustainable strength. So, you know, if he can keep guys on him, but in terms of his ability, you know, it's more of a defensive line term, but speed to power, you know, that initial twitch, he is probably the best offensive tackle in this class. Yeah, exactly. And then three cone. Uh, this is maybe what coaches would say if they had any drill that they pay attention to, it's three cone drill. Because this is one that measures agility, flexibility, the ability to change direction. Again, all things are very important for the offensive line, but every position really in football because you're going to be doing all these kind of things. And and so he, again, measured really well for the three-cone drill, had a good number, and uh, so it shows that ability just to, to move back and forth and, and handle speed rushers on the outside and those counter moves to the inside. Yeah, exactly. And I just wanted to touch on his three-cone a little bit. He was in the 96th percentile with a 7.29 seconds at about 300 pounds. Dalvin Cook at 210 pounds had a 7.27. So two hundredths of a second off. Yeah. So (laughs) he's got good movement that we don't have to worry about that. And then maybe the most overrated or stupidest thing that we still have at the combine is the bench press. Um, It's something that shows upper body strength, but it doesn't really show functional strength. So it's not really showing anything. You know, a guy can have 11 bench press uh, reps and still be strong. You know, that, that's there's a big difference between the two. I wouldn't really pay attention too much to any of those kind of numbers. Uh, I don't think Bulls did that at the at the combine anyway. Yeah, he had a strained pec, so oh, he did not right. participate in the bench press. But the bench press, you're right when you say that it doesn't really translate to strength. But from talking with scouts, the thing that they look at for the bench press is – you know, if you are above a certain threshold, you know, it doesn't matter how much more you do. But if you absolutely blow at the bench press, they're going to question your work ethic because you can get in the gym and get those numbers up. So it's really more about are you a gym rat or not? Are you willing to put in the work or not? Yeah. Now, what I was reading on it, they were asking a scout about it. And he said, yes, it can show those kind of things. But they said, most likely we've already known that about them. You know, we've talked to coaches. We've already know who's in the gym, who's not in the gym, you know, all those kind of things. So I I think you can figure out the bench press without or what the bench press shows without actually have to do the bench press. But it's still it's it's just another number for them to investigate. If it's a low number, then it's more questions for them to bring up. It's more that core strength that where he has some issues, not that upper body strength. I mean, obviously, you can keep it in the gym and get stronger. But I mean, we'll talk about that a little more coming up. But. Yeah. But anyway, before we get into what he did on the field, the reason that I say Bowles is maybe the most interesting draft prospect, maybe in the entire draft because of his story. I mean, he, he's got a pretty crazy story if you actually look into it. And I did some a little bit of digging and, and it's I found a few more things than I even knew about before. So I wanted to go through that a little bit here um, just so everybody understands the life and, and how much bulls had to work to get here and how many people had to help him to get here. You know, I mean, this is a guy that's very appreciative to have reached the point that he has because he was not dealt a very good hand to start off with, grew up in a pretty gang heavy area, got into some pretty bad things, got himself into the wrong crowd, started making some bad decisions such as using drugs, um, cutting class, broke the law, ended up in in jail for a little bit. That was back in, in 2011 or 2010. And then he, his family reached a point, his dad actually kicked him out of the house. Now think about this, 2011, this is just a teenager and kicked out of his house. His dad threw a couple, few bags of clothes out with him and said, you know, you can't be here. We can't have this here anymore. As a parent, I can't imagine trying to make that kind of decision, but kicked out of his own house, sitting on the street corner and the Freeman family, Garrett Bowles is probably going to talk about them a lot because he'll talk that they pretty much saved him. Uh, the Freeman family saw him there and they picked him up. Now imagine that you're picking up this, you know, six, five. I don't know how tall he was at that point, but probably still a pretty big kid and said, hey, saw that you got kicked out of your house. Come join us and come into our house. So, yeah, they invited him to come home with them. 
And they laid down some strict ground rules. They told him, this is what it's going to take for you to stay here. You're going to stop hanging out with your old friends. You're going to start going to church with us. You're going to get a job. You're going to tie that of that job. You break any of these, you're kicked out of the house. And uh, they didn't think that the bulls would be able to handle it. They actually thought he was going to get kicked out pretty quick. And But he, he did it. He took the opportunity and worked at a garage um, for about two years and, and credits that time with really getting his life back on track, had some time to really just talk about how he got to that point and how to become a better man. You know, the Freeman family really mentored him and helped him to, to go from an angry kid to a hardworking, grateful kid. And so, yeah, kid was dealt a bad hand, but really brought himself out of it. You know, some people will con condemn his dad, but he was at the end of his rope. I mean, Bowles' mother had uh, substance abuse, abuse issues as, as well, going back to when he was uh, in elementary school. So it's something that he grew up around, and he obviously then got, you know, as happens a lot of times when there's substance abuse in homes with children, he kind of followed that path and got involved with gangs, blew off classes, and he was even arrested at one point for vandalizing a rival high school's field, and he spent time in jail for it. So at the end of the rope, his father, who I believe was a Navy man, said, you know what, I love you, but there's other kids in the house, and I just have to, you know, you, you can't stay here anymore. So the Freemans then took him up, and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, exactly. And there, there is a reason that also beyond all of that, that he is 25 years old, or going to be 25 here before the season starts. Um, I know a lot of people are getting after him, you know, I can't believe, you know, we took this older prospect and we'll get into that here in a little bit more, but something else that helped him to get his life back on track and why he calls Colorado home is he spent two years in Colorado Springs doing the LDS church mission and uh, just credits that time with really helping him to focus and realize what's important in his life. And after that is when he decided that he wanted to give football another shot. He really wanted to, to commit to it and commit to college and decided to go to Snow College in Utah. And I love I love what his coach did. This is, again, why Garrett Bowles, he will credit so many people for helping him to get to the point that he is. His coach sat him down and said, here's the deal. You're not coming here just to play football. You are coming here because you are a student first. And in college, that's rare. I don't think people realize when you start talking about college prospects, and, and I know this is a smaller college and all of that kind of thing, but but still, you know, college coaches are are under a lot of pressure to win. And uh, so, you know, you, you get to a point where you have kind of like a, did you see the thing about Cardell Jones this last week? I did not. What happened? Well, do you remember he was the prospect that said, I don't know why I have to go to class. I came here to play football. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, he, he graduated from Ohio State this week, and he put on his, on his cap something about there once was a student that said, I came here to, to play football. And, and, uh, but he actually went and got his education, kind of figured out, you know, maybe I actually need one. Maybe I'm not as good a football player as I thought I was. And uh, so, yeah, Garrett really committed himself to, to his, uh, his schoolwork, spent hours upon hours in the library working, and uh, – just just worked his tail off to get where he is. He uh, says that his hero is Michael Orr, you know, the Blind Side movie, uh, the story about Michael Orr, and he actually had posters of him. You know, most college kids have posters of some, uh, you know, bikini girl or whatever it may be. He had no posters. Comment. Of, yeah. <laughs> he no had comment. Posters, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll leave that one alone. But he had posters <laughs> of Michael Orr on his wall because that's, you know, that's the story that he wanted for his life. To, to go from nothing to, you know, his NFL dream. Then it was during this time he uh, met his wife, Natalie. And, and this is such a cool story. The, people need to understand he has such a cool wife. Um, when he asked her out, she said yes. And, uh, you know, here's this guy again, 6'5", almost 300 pounds, coming up and asking her out on a date. And so she went home and decided to Google him because she didn't know that he was a football player, didn't know anything about him and Googled him, and the first thing that popped up was his mugshot. Now, most women probably would sit there and say, mugshot just popped up, you know what, I'm ditching this date. And But she decided to show up, and Garrett was very honest, and, and he'll be very honest. I mean, this is, I mean, we, we know all this information because he flat out says, this is what my life was. 
and uh, just really opened up to her and you know the rest is history they're married they had their first child who was you know the famous kid that he did the Lion King moment at the draft Simba. night <laughs> it's a pretty awesome moment I, yeah that was pretty cool to see I don't think the uh, the kid's gonna remember it for the rest of his life like you said but yeah, that was a pretty cool moment lifting him up and everything. He yeah. was just nervous, I'm sure. There was a, I was expecting a bunch of memes from that. You know, he was just all rambling and excited. And he's like, "This is something he's gonna remember for the rest of his life." I'm like, "Bulls, I get it. I get it. You're excited, but he's like two months old. He's not. He's not gonna remember this." <laughs> you know what? It could be a genius child. Remembers his birth. Yeah, you know, maybe. <laughs> anyway, so yes, that's that's kind of how we he, he made this decision to go to Utah right after they were playing at Snow College, being one of the top, uh, you know, top recruits coming out of there and uh the rest is history you know he's repaired his relationship with his biological dad just has worked hard to to become a better man and and that's why i don't really worry about all that off the field you know some people talked about that of you know he was arrested and thrown in jail and all these other things that he did and i don't worry about that you know he's got good people around him he's got people who care about him beyond hey this guy just made millions of dollars um, there was a, a player for, for Dallas that went through that where his family was calling him all the time going, give us money. You know, he, he finally had to get a court order for his family to stay away. I don't worry about that with Bulls. Wow. You know, he's got, got a good family that's going to keep him on track and, and make sure he stays good. Yeah, and I agree with you completely. He's somebody that I don't worry about at all in terms of, you know, his mental makeup. You know, he did get a nine on the wonder look. Uh, which had some people worried about it, but he, I believe he has dyslexia and he's just, he's just never been, you know, a great student, but he's going to put in the time. He's going to put in the work and, you know, he had numerous tutors. He'd stay, he said he was working a 60 to 70 hour work week, you know, of trying to stay in class um, in the library until like, you know, 2 AM, 3 AM studying and then with football on top of it. So he's somebody that I'm, I mean, that, again, going back to the, uh, Leary talking today with Denver media, he said that the, he threw out a couple plays at Bulls and Bulls snapped back right away that he knew the play. So, I mean, it's already, you know, two weeks in and obviously the technique and actually going out there and running the plays is going to be a little bit different, but he knew, he knew the plays and he's gearing up and I think it might be a quicker learning curve than many people realized. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, and I kind of wonder, I was thinking about this today, but I was driving home from golf practice I wonder if that's a little bit of getting Jamal Charles because he has dys dyslexia. And uh, I just wonder if maybe that's, you know, help that he could come over and say, Hey, this is how I learned the playbook. This is how I've really studied. And, you know, and if, if, if Bulls is already doing great with that, then that's great. But I wonder if Charles can be there to help out just a little bit and teach him some different techniques of how to better learn a playbook, even with the, you know, the learning disability. And, and again, that, that's something he has overcome so much. And I, I just, I'm impressed by this guy. I'm excited just by his off the field demeanor and, and uh, just his want to be great. I'm also excited by his on the field demeanor. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, yeah, we that's, yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, we can get into the good here a little bit where he is a very physical player and maybe my very favorite quote that I've ever heard from a draft prospect um, he said this, he said, I'm, I'm just excited to get out there and put my guys in the, or put guys in the dirt, my running back Devonte Booker or whoever it is can score touchdowns. If you touch my receiver, if you touch my quarterback, you touch anyone on my team or my organization, it's like touching my wife. You're going to get in trouble by me. Love it. That's just one of the best quotes. <laughs> yeah. and, and he means it, you know, he, one of his issues was that he was, he got a lot of personal foul penalties. You know, because he was too aggressive. And uh, I love that. I, I'd rather have a player too aggressive and, and work to try to calm him down just a little bit. You know, teach him how to better understand when the whistle blows, you finish. Um, but yeah, that's that's awesome. That's the new mentality of our offensive line. You hear Leary talk like that. You hear Garcia talk like that. You hear Watson talk like that. I mean, it, it's just awesome to hear that that's the kind of offensive line that we're building right now. Yeah, and you know, you don't want to cheer for dirty plays but if you know if somebody touches the quarterback hits them a little late or doing a little extracurriculars i want my offensive lineman to go back on that next play and put those guys on the ground period you know they exactly. have to be the enforcers out there they have to be the mean ones you know they're called the big uglies for a reason 
they're supposed to be scary. <laughs> and I love that mentality with bulls. And it's not just, you know, there's plenty of mean guys who can't play world's full of them, <laughs> but bulls can play. I mean, we talked about as athletic numbers and we talked about that nastiness, but he also has a skill set that, I mean, obviously he was the first offensive tackle taken in his class, but he has the skill set to be a very good tackle in this league for a long time. Yeah. And, and people have to remember it wasn't just the Broncos that had this guy rated so high. There were at least two other teams that were trying to trade ahead of the Broncos to get this guy. He, he was loved by a lot of teams for, for what he brings on the field. And I think Seattle for sure was one and, and the giants were the other, you know, they've been, yep. they, both those teams have been needing a left tackle, just like Garrett Bowles. So um, I I'm, I'm excited to see what he brings on the field. And you know, what I saw there at, at Utah was a guy who improved as the year went on. He kind of struggled there early on with a couple teams and a couple different players, but you know, he, he gave up three sacks this last year and 16 quarterback hurries, one quarterback hit, but he just, he worked to improve and he just got better and better and, and became one of the best run blocking offensive tackles in, in this entire draft. Um, that's at least according to, to pro football focus. And, and I agree. I mean, I think you see that on tape. I mean, they, that left side with him and Asiata. Oh my goodness. I mean, there, there were some dogs. Holes. Yeah. Th th there were times the running back wasn't touched because these guys would take on two, three guys at a time and just move them straight back. So yeah, that, that excites me to see with him and Leary on that left side and see what they can do to open up a hole, man, that third and one, one play. I know I keep talking about that. I keep harping on that because that was one of my least favorite plays last year. Oh my goodness. I'm going to, I'm going to blow a vein in my head thinking about third and one here. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, I don't worry about that. I, I'm not worried about that for this year. I, we have guys that are going to move people and that's something we've been lacking big time. Yeah. And I want something, I want people to understand that Bowles, I mean, he may not be, great the first year i mean he is raw he is still you know he can get to the spots but he's still a little bit slow at the mental processing you know the spatial awareness kind of aspect of you know getting to that second level and he may not be as good as okung was last year okung somebody who a lot of people harp on but i feel like he struggled a lot because of the offense the guys around him and the quarterback and the running backs not taking lanes and if bowls can live up to what okung did last year this first year we have ourselves a keeper because with what Okung is getting paid and, you know, having bulls for that, the five years, potentially five years, just would be a huge get for the structure of the team and the roster going forward. And he has the ability to do that. I mean, he has quick feet and, you know, you didn't see him have to hold for very, not holds the wrong word, you know, not physically hold like a penalty, but had to sustain pass blocks for super long because of the style of offense Utah ran. So there is some projection there, but given his overall physical attributes and the times that he did flash on tape, I'm not too worried about his ability to learn to be a solid defender against speed rushers, which you need in the AFC West. And when he does face speed rushers, I mean, he can really get good depth in that kick step because he is so athletic and smooth in those short distances. He's going to have to work with Davidson in terms of making that kick step consistent. I didn't always see it be, you know, the same depth every single time he'd be out there because sometimes, you know, he'll be a little bit too aggressive and he'll be trying to catch those guys, you know, get that first hit a little too early. But, I mean, you got you to gotta love the physical upside there. But, yeah, he can use his arms to keep defenders out of his chest because he has those 34-inch arms, which, you know, you touched on. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a stats guy. And, you know, it's not the longer arms you have, the better. It's like if you have 33 or above, you're probably going to be able to make it a tackle. It's about those, those limits, you know, the cutoffs. And he has an adequate frame, and I think he can get bigger and stronger still. I mean, he has not been playing the Division One football for but a year. He played at Snow College. He actually came to Snow College as a defensive tackle, and they converted him to offensive line. So he's still pretty new to the position in general, and I think he can get much bigger and stronger. And you touched on it. His growth, especially mentally, was almost linear. You know, there's no such thing as linear uh, progression with prospects. You don't see that often. That's the reason that people – that's one of the reasons Dak wasn't a first-round pick last year, uh, Dak Prescott. You saw him improve pretty strikingly from his junior year to his senior year as a pocket passer. But, you know, you don't normally see them take a step after that. You know, it's not linear. You don't see that very often. You know, there's thresholds and they go up and down a little bit in terms of they progress. You know, there's some regression. You see guys like Cutler or Bradley Roby, perfect example. They just, it's not a linear progression. But when you watch Bulls' film chronologically, 
you saw linear progression because he was raw and he was still figuring out just the the tendencies and the little nuances of the game. First game I saw him probably get, you know, three or four false starts. He just, God damn it, drew off sides on a hard count. But by the end of the year, I mean, you didn't see that as much. You didn't see the holds and you saw him doing a better job with just the little parts of the game. And I think getting him in with NFL coaching in an NFL locker room and weight room. I mean, this guy's got tremendous potential. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if by the season started, he'd be up there to about 315. You know, it's amazing what they can do in the NFL of get him on a proper diet, get him in a, in a proper weight room, working on the right things. I mean, Utah has never really been known um, as kind of offensive line university. They should be this year. I mean, with how many guys they had, yeah. um, I, I would take their entire offensive line. I think I've said that before. But, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what he can do and how he can grow because I think he has a body, a frame that can really add some weight and, and good weight. You know, that, that's a big difference. You can add weight. Good weight. You know, anybody can add weight. I, I can go home and I can eat, you know, a little bit of everything and I'll gain 15 pounds. Um, but that's not good weight. He can do that. And so there, there, there's so many good things. There, there's a lot of concerns. Like you said, year one, I don't know what he's going to do. I'm hoping for the best, but – most offensive tackles, especially left tackles, don't usually do good year, year one. Last year was kind of an anomaly, um, especially since we had this new CBA signed where they don't get as much contact. They don't get as much time to work with the coaches. Um, they just they take a while. And uh, so that, that could be the case. But he's a hard worker. He's got good players around him. He's going to have a great veteran next to him. You know, we found out today for sure that Leary is going to play left guard. That's going to help out a lot. You know, I, I remember, what was it, a few years ago with the, the Broncos, they had uh, Zane Beatles. And when he was next to Clady, he was a Pro Bowl left guard. Well, when Clady went down in 2013, you saw Beatles go down in ability too. You know, that, that makes a big difference when you're having to worry about not only what your assignment is, but what is the assignment of the guy next to me? You know, is he going to blow it? And uh, so with having Leary there, he can focus on this is just my assignment. I don't have to worry about that guy next to me. So I, I, I could see a decent year, especially if we really work on the, the power running game and play to his strengths and and give him a little bit of help. You know, we, we got some good blocking tight ends. Uh, don't be afraid to give him help. You know, that was oh Kubiak. Yeah, I love, I love the guy. But, <laughs> you know, when when your right tackle is giving up five sacks in a game, not just a game a half uh, yeah and a half i mean it's just it's just nuts that you keep leaving him out on an island you know you've just destroyed this guy's psyche not only are you blowing the game but you're blowing this guy's psyche so yeah i i look forward to seeing what they can do to help him out and and see how he grows and i think he's i think he's going to be a great fit with the broncos he's like you said he's a little bit small needs a little bit more core strength if we're going to be going to this gap you know power scheme um but he can get there, and I know he's gonna he's gonna work for it. Yeah, and we don't want to be you know all roses here. I mean, he did last to the twentieth pick in a and was the first offensive tackle taken. I think it was the latest since the eighties. So he does have some issues, obviously. But like we touched on he does not come from a very pro style scheme. You know, there are some questions about his pass blocking, especially out of the gate. You know, he had a running quarterback who would look to ditch the pocket early, and oftentimes didn't help him out. There was a a gif. We were both talking about on Twitter that we saw and somebody said, oh, this is a, you know, a poor, not a poor play. They didn't say it was a poor play, but people were commenting on it that it was a poor play by Bulls because he gave up the strip sack. There was, you know, five, six yards, five, six yards, not, you know, a couple steps that the quarterback had to step up and give Bulls a chance because Bulls did his job as far as I could see. You know, he let Tack McKinley fly by him and there was a huge gap in that, the, the B gap in between the left guard and left tackle. And the quarterback just stood back there and pulled the ball back and got it stripped. So he does have the tools to be a, a decent to very solid pass blocking left tackle, but he's going to, that's still some projection just because of the style of offense with how raw he is, the, you know, the amount of tape he's had, et cetera. And like you talked about, he's going to have to get in the NFL weight room, get stronger, get more technical with the coaches. Um, I'm not that concerned about that though. Year one, I'm not, I don't have the highest expectations about, you know, what he's not going to come in and be, Tyron Smith or Trent Williams, but if he can come in and be league average, that's going to be huge. But yeah, overall, I'm, I'm excited about the pick and I think that he's going to be a good player for us in the near future. And you know what, as uh Vach Lombardi said, when he came on and told us to take Garrett Bowles 
uh, is, you know, good call, botch. <laughs> uh, if he doesn't work at left tackle, put him at right tackle. You know, we have Watson, who we're not sure about health-wise. Sambrelo hasn't done anything for us, really. And Donald Stevenson might be a camp cut. So we might be looking to tackle again next year, and we might have to put Bulls at right tackle. That's, to me, the worst-case scenario. But that's not the worst thing. I mean, especially in the AFC West, where you have the best edge rushers in the entire NFL, I'm comfortable saying that the AFC West is stacked with edge rushers. If you have to go look tackle maybe somewhere else next year, I'm not upset at all going having two good first round bookends. I mean, look what it's doing for Mariota and the Titans. And I think that's a that's a model that not the worst one to follow because that's gonna help that young QB that we have, whoever right. it is. And it keeps down two of the more expensive positions in football. You know, keeps them on cheap contracts for us. So, you know, protects the young quarterback and gets us two bookends. Yeah, not a bad deal. All right, well, let's move on. We're going to go to our second-round pick, Demarcus Walker, a outside linebacker, defensive end, or defensive tackle, depending who you talk to. Um, I was a little surprised by his number, number 57. That's not usually what you look for on the defensive line. So that's, I don't know, I was a little, I, I, I was shocked by that. I couldn't believe he got that number, but uh, that's fine. I mean, we'll see what happens with him. But he's 6'4", 280 pounds, and has about 10 and a half inch hands, 33 inch arms. And just getting into his, his combine and pro day, he actually didn't do much with the combine. He only did bench and he had 18 reps. But his pro day, he put up some, some decent numbers. He had a, a four, seven, six, 40, a nine foot, um, seven inch broad jump, 7.913 cone. Now, I'm, I'm gonna let you talk about that here because you had a nice little comment about this. Yeah, the 7.913 cone, I was, uh... You know, listening to some other people talk about the Bronco class, I'm like, well, this is a pretty bad three cone. I'm pulling up his spider graph right now on Mock Draftable, and it is at the first percentile, one. So it's like literally touching the middle, and that's not good. You know, you want the web to be big on those spider graphs, and that's not good. So, I mean, you can see it on tape. He's not the most fluid guy uh, laterally, side to side. You know, his agility is not great, especially when you're watching him try to, to stop Lamar Jackson and that RPO with that Louisville does very well but he had like we said he had a 7.91 and since they started collecting and recording data from the combine only five guys have weighed that or less and the three cone but have done that poorly weighing 280 or less and all of all of them but one went undrafted so that's not very good company i mean he's got obviously some of his other uh, drills like we'll talk about here were solid but his three cone very poor and his uh, his other drill that was super poor was his 20-yard split. So another one that has to do with that lateral agility where he had a 2.85 seconds during his pro day. And that put him at the zeroth percentile. I don't even know if that's that's an English word. Zeroth? <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> there so, you go. Yeah. That's just some that, – there's some concerns there. I'm somebody who will tell you uh, combine numbers, measurements, should only be about 10% to 15% of the, the player's score. But – that is something I worry about, especially with defensive linemen. I like my defensive linemen to be a little more fluid and a little more twitched up, especially laterally, where they're going to have to go against zone stretch plays and redirect based on uh, deception, whether it be play action or counters or anything like that. Yeah, no, I agree. But there, there is reason for hope. There is reason the Broncos like this guy. And some of those we can see just, I mean, the, stat, the raw stats are incredible for this guy. He had 27 sacks in, in college. That is fourth most in Florida State history. What you think of all the players that have come out of Florida State, and this guy is fourth most. I mean, that, that's pretty impressive. He had 179 tackles with 41 and a half tackles for loss. And, and just his final season, I mean, these are, these are numbers that honestly actually compare to when uh, Von Miller came out. Not quite to Von Miller numbers, but I mean, he actually pretty, pretty good numbers here. Um, 68 tackles, 21 and a half tackles for loss. 16 sacks, three forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and a blocked field goal. Those are good numbers. Um, but as many will tell you, college numbers don't always mean pro success. So that's, that's where you got you to gotta be careful. You can't sit here and say, oh, he was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year. That means he's going to be great. And, and, and there have been some great ACC Defensive Players of the Year. Luke Kuechly, Aaron Donald. You know, there, there's some some great ones that have come out of there, but there's been some others that have done very little. 
um, last year's. I'm trying to remember who it was. Jeremy uh, Cash. Jeremy Cash. You know, didn't he go undrafted? He went undrafted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, that that's a great award to have, but it doesn't automatically mean success. So, you know, you just have to, to be very careful with that. Um, but I do know this guy, just looking at some of his background, that there's some, some great things that I love. Um, behind the scenes on this kid, he's known by many as one of the hardest workers at becoming great. You know, you hear it in his interviews. He talks about it. I want to be great. I want to put, you know, those naysayers to the side like a Nick Kendall. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Or an Eric Trickle. There we go. Maybe a little <laughs> more there. Um, sorry, Eric. But no, uh, yeah, he, he wants to be great. He wants to put his naysayers to the side and he's going to work his tail off to get there. Um, one thing I was reading about when he was in college, he would on spring break, you know, this is the time, you know, they can't have practice. They can't really do much of anything. They can, you know, they can go off and do their, their thing. And instead of going to Miami, cause he lived there in Florida, grew up in Florida. He talked about, you know, when he first came to Colorado and it was snowing that day, that was the first time he's ever seen snow live. But anyway, instead of going out partying, he would go return home to Jacksonville and spend the entire time working out in his hometown. I mean, he just lived in the weight room. He loved that. And so, you know, those kind of things excite me. That's that's why I have maybe that that little bit more glimmer of hope that he could become something. You know, this this whole week right now, right here before, you know, rookie minicamp kicks off, you know, his last time to really kind of get away before football really kicks into high gear for all these rookies. He's spending it at his his old high school encouraging students to stay on track and out of trouble to achieve their dreams. So just a, a really neat kid. You know, he's got leadership skills that um, Florida people talk or Florida state people talk about all the time. Um, you know, he just didn't want to come off the field, which was good and bad. You know, he, he tired out pretty quickly because he put out so much effort on, you know, so many plays and he wouldn't come out. And so he'd almost become a liability, but but like I said, this guy has a great attitude. I think he's going to be great in the locker room. And uh, he has a certain skill set that I think can be really good for this team. And, and I'll, I'll let you talk about that. What, what do you see as maybe a translatable skill set? Well, when I watch Walker, where he dominates is that one-on-one -on -one situation lined up over the guard where he can you know, base his snap a little better. He's not as slow on the get off there. And I think that has a lot to do with since he's closer to the ball, he can see it and react quicker. Um, he's not, you know, he's not a twitched up edge rusher. We're kind of spoiled because we got Shane Ray, we've had Ware, we've had Von, we have Von Miller, uh, Barrett, and even the guys like uh, Dora and Watson last year in uh, training camp. You know, those are the more of the speed rusher types, which Walker is not a speed rusher. He'd be more of a seven technique rather than a wide nine in terms of the type of pass rusher that he is. But where he dominates, and I want to say dominates because he is very good here, is where he lines up over that guard in you know third and long, second and long, obvious passing situations. He can have a one-on-one -on -one situation, fire off well, decent leverage, and then use that rip and swim move to just shove guards aside. I mean, literally, just he tosses them aside and then creates pressure. He has a very good motor. And for a guy who played, you know, 90 to 120% of his team snaps every week, the way he was able to really, you know, get stronger as the game went on, despite all those snaps, is pretty impressive. He just wears those matchups down. So I don't really see him probably being a guy who's going to be a five technique year one, if ever. I don't really see him being having that anchor uh, to be a guy who you want taking on double teams. That's just not how he wins. You know, he doesn't have that anchor that base where he's going to be a guy who's a tree stump you know they call them tree stumps where they don't move them because they're just planted in the ground and they can you know 600 pounds is pushing them they're not moving if anything they're pushing them back that's one of the things i loved about malik mcdowell in the draft this year despite being 285 290 pounds playing nose tackle at 66 he was a tree stump because he fired off so low so strong and you don't see that as much with walker but when walker times that snap right and is able to play that one-on-one -on -one over the guard I mean, he can wreck havoc and get after the quarterback. And we missed that this year. You know, that's something that Antonio Smith was great at. That's something that Malik Jackson was great at. You don't really see that as much with Goatsis, and you didn't really see that as much with Crick or Wolf, who was off, uh, injured multiple times last year. So I'm excited about bringing Walker in for 
that kind of skill set, you know, where he's going to be lining up over that guard. Maybe they'll play him at five tech some, but you want that to be in some special packages because I don't see him being a guy where, you know, third and one, they're probably going to run it at him. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be that guy. You know, if you, if you put on DeMarcus Walker's tape against Ole Miss this last year, you know, if you just look at his numbers, you'll see that he had four and a half sacks. Well, that's awesome. That's great. But if you watch the tape, I mean, with that good plays that you have, you also have plenty of bad where you see him getting blown off the ball, specifically in the run game. So he's going to have to get bigger. He's going to have to get stronger. He's going to have to work with Kohler and get in the weight room and just work on that anchor because, I mean, he is a big boy. He measured it at 280. But year one and maybe forward, he might just end up being a rotational interior pass rusher, which is not the worst thing. I mean, you look at guys like Geno Atkins, Aaron Donald. You know, They're also pretty damn good against the run. But where they make their money is the fact that they can get interior pressure on the quarterback, and that is just super valuable in today's NFL. Yeah, there's nothing a quarterback hates more than interior pressure. You know, Tom Brady. There's nothing Tom Brady hates more than interior pressure. Right, right, and, and that's yeah, and that's. But I, I think that's all quarterbacks, really. I mean, I don't think there's a single quarterback out there. I mean, and some of them are greater at escaping. But you know, I had somebody ask me the other day, "How do you ta- attack Tom Brady?" And I said, "You get pressure up the middle." And I mean, that's what we did in the, the AFC championship game. We had pressure up the middle that forced him to have to stay back. You know, he couldn't just step up in the pocket and let Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware just kind of run around the backside. You know, I remember 2012 season. <clears throat> oh, goodness. Okay. I'm going to talk about the Baltimore Ravens game. Uh, let's let's not. Skip ahead, guys. Okay. Let's, sorry. Let's sorry. Okay. 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 No, but <laughs> just, just, just a quick note of, you know, what they figured out was, you know, they could do one-on-one matchups in the middle. And then just really work to make Von Miller and 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 uh, and Doomerville back then just keep running to the outside. And all Joe Flacco had to do was step up into this nice little pocket. If we had just one more time of getting interior pressure in that game, you know that changes the entire game and uh, changes maybe all of history for the Broncos. I don't know, but we won't go there completely. But I, I you know, like I said, this is these are important players. If you can find a guy that can get that interior pressure, that's huge. Um, you know, Nick and I earlier today, we, we do this all the time where we just talk about different players and and uh, what we see in them. And, and I found a really cool comparison, I think. Um, Tom Johnson. And I say that name and everybody's going, who? Um, I went who. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he is a defensive tackle for the Vikings. And you're not going to hear his name because he doesn't put up like these huge, great raw stats of, you know, 10, 12 sacks from the interior. But he is one of the best pressure interior guys out there. You know, he he's only put in really on pass rushing uh, situations. I think only like 19 percent of his snaps were run plays. So, they, you know, he's, he's a niche player. Um but what he does is he does great, and and they love him. And he was actually voted by, I think it was other NFL players, as one of the top 10 interior pass rushers. And, you know, again, he was one of those guys when people saw that list were kind of like, what in the world? Who is this guy? But you watch him, and he has an important role. And that's that's what I'm hoping Walker can be year one for us. You know, I want him to grow into more because you don't use a second-round pick on just a, a part-time player. You're hoping this guy becomes a starter for you. And so maybe they can grow him a little bit more, get him a little more, um, at, you know, get some of that stiffness out of his game. I don't know. That's always tough to do. Uh, that's, you know, you're either flexible or you're not. Yoga. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> go work with Vaughn Miller. Go do some dancing. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but, you know, yeah, he can still have a big role this year, this year one. He can still be a, a big presence. And that, that's going to depend a little bit on can our offense do something to actually force teams to have to pass a little bit more. You know, if we do that, then then Walker could be of great value to this team. Yeah, agreed completely. And even if he is just a niche guy, year one, we really missed that last year. You know, how many times, especially in that Titans game, granted, it's going to need, we're going to need to be able to stop the run first if we were going to actually realize his value because we need to force those third and longs. But if you can get, you know, third and long and those obvious passing downs where you have our secondary, then you have Von Miller, Shane Ray, Barrett. Marshall, who's a pretty good interior pass rusher, and uh, Walker coming up the middle. I mean, that's going to be a nightmare, and that's going to change our passing defense. You thought we had a great passing defense this year. It would be even better if we can get some of those third longs and just unleash that. Get some nice little NASCAR packages going. 
Oh my gosh, my heart. You've given him palpitations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, moving right along, we got to, you know, throw out a little bit of advertising here. According to a study from the Interactive Advertising Bureau and Edison Research, consumers are highly likely to purchase from podcast sponsors. According to the survey of 1,000 podcast listeners, nearly two-thirds of them were more willing to consider purchasing products and services they learned about during a podcast. 60% added that given equal price and quality, they prefer to purchase from companies that advertise on their favorite podcasts. So if any of our listeners out there are looking to target specifically the male demographic, 20 to 40 years of age, we are a perfect opportunity to reach this male demographic. Please reach out to Chad Jensen at milehighhuddle at gmail.com in order to discuss this awesome opportunity. All right, Carl, well, moving right along, we got to talk about 2018 already. You know, we're running a little long. We have so much information on these guys. We're really doing a deep dive on this Bronco draft class, but we got a few minutes left and I can't help it. I'm already starting to look forward to 2018. We're not going to do a deep five in 2018, uh, a deep dive. But there are positions that I, I mean, looking at the roster, we're starting to come over it and, you know, see where there's potential weaknesses. And I can, you know, compile a little list here of some potential ones that we may be looking at in 2018. And do you have any that jump out to you that you think, you know, obvious area that the Broncos may be looking and we might be talking about a new guy at this point next year? Well, I look at inside linebacker. Marshall was pretty banged up this last year and wasn't quite that same player. And Davis, you know, he's a restricted free agent. So that means, you know, he could be gone this next year. And, and, and really, he's one of those guys like you like him, kind of, but he's replaceable. You know, you're always looking to, to upgrade that position. So um, I, I could see inside linebacker. But again, we, we always talk about this every year. You know, Elway, take an inside linebacker, and then he passes on him until late rounds or doesn't even take one. So, you know, it's just, it's not a position that they value a whole lot. They think they can get guys that fit their, their needs and, and they've done well with it. You know, Travis then in the sixth round, Marshall, you know, they picked off the waiver wire. Um, so they, they've done well with that. And I think we still have some young guys too, that, that I think we like and could develop into something. So I, I don't know we'll, we'll see about that position, but I, I would just like to have a star player there. You know, you look at some of these, these top teams around the league and, uh, on defense and you got those those Kukleys, the you know the 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 Bowmans, you know, those guys that just really can change an entire game with one play. And I just I wish we had that. Yeah, I feel what you're saying, but you know, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different route. I'm gonna support Elway here. Uh because I there's too many Bronco fans already that needed to be talked off the edge after we didn't take Ruben Foster. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I've had to talk a few people down like, hey, it wasn't the worst call. Everyone told me Ruben Foster's shoulder was a serious issue. It came back. It failed medical rechecks and because it didn't take. And that, that came out after the draft. You know, we've been saying that for a little bit, guys. Listen to us. We actually have some inside sources. But, think, yeah, that's not a surprise. Sorry, yeah, and, oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I think the thing that scared me a little bit more about him was hearing that the Alabama coaches talked about how they had to pretty much hold his hand and his the entire time they were that he was there, um, you know that he was a big time partier, wanted to go out all the time, and uh, the coaches had to really work hard to keep him focused. And you know, you get to the NFL, you're kind of going, "This is your job. Like we just expect that you know how to do this. We're not we're not going to sit here and hold your hand the entire time." So I just you know. I, I understand why they passed on him. He's he's a huge talent. I told you he was one of my – he might have been my favorite player in the entire draft. And after hearing a lot of the things that came out, yeah, I, was, I wasn't disappointed that we passed on him because I like Bowles too. And I think he's going to be a great player for us and, and fit a lot of things. But, um, yeah, I don't think Bronco fans should be as upset about that as, as what they are. Yeah, and agreed. And it's, it has to do a lot to do with that – the value of the position for me personally. I mean, given what Elway's been able to do and – just looking at next year's class, there appears to be some pretty solid depth. Um, you got Malik Jefferson from Texas, who's the top player. He's a freak athlete, kind of maybe another Miles Jack. Uh, Jerome Baker from Ohio State. Cameron Smith from USC. Azeem Victor from Washington. Christian Miller from Alabama. And one of my personal favorites, because I'm biased, uh, Josie Jewell from Iowa, who's going to be a solid player, I believe. Yeah. But, yeah, so that's it's a position that I think we will definitely be looking at next year. It's probably the weakest on the defense. And... If we don't take it round one, I'm guessing probably the first. We should get – hopefully we'll get two uh, – hopefully we'll get an extra third-round pick comp pick next year for uh, losing Okung. But, you know, we'll have an option to look at linebacker pretty early. Agreed. 
Agreed. And, and yeah, like you said, value of the position, that's, uh, like I said, it's it's not something that Elway values, and it's not something that the NFL values a whole lot. Um, I mean, that, that you can see that by just how much those players get compared, get paid compared to like an edge defender, cornerback, or offensive tackle, or anything like that. So um, it's just a position that I see, uh, I'd like to see upgraded. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of other positions that I, I think the Broncos could really look at. Um, like we have marked here, offensive tackle. Again. And, yeah, I know. And people are going, what? Offensive? We just took one. Um, Middlelick Watson, uh, you look at his contract. Yes, he's getting paid pretty good money, but compared to some of the other players that just took huge offensive tackle money, you know, he was kind of a, a risk reward kind of guy. Like if he turns out, that's great. Then we have our right tackle position solved. But even then, you know, he's injury prone, hasn't ever finished a season. So just have to see what he can bring to the table. And, and after this year, he only has about $2.7 million in dead money if we cut him. So, you know, Broncos work to, to protect themselves on this one. And you had said earlier that worst case scenario, you move Bowles over to right tackle. And then you look at this left tackle class for, for next year. You know, we've, we've watched some of these players. We were hoping some of them would come out this year because they would have been the first offensive tackle taken in this draft. And uh, the, some of them decided to go back and, you know, th that, that's fine for them. You know, they get another year of learning and it's going to be a great offensive tackle class. I think I would not yeah. be shocked if you saw five, six of them go in the first round. Yeah. And I agree. And that doesn't make the pick of bulls bad this year either. I mean, it's just double dipping at what is a incredibly valuable position. I mean, you've seen Elway double dip at edge rusher already with Von Miller. I mean, he took Shane Ray when he wasn't even a projected starter. So taking another offensive tackle, because those guys literally get paid ridiculous money. I mean, we talked about it on the last shows. All the top, even not I don't even want to call them top. All the mediocre offensive tackles that were on the free agent market this year were gobbled up day one and paid ridiculous money. And so ha having two young offensive tackles – that you know can be cost controlled and set those bookends for the hopefully the next 10 years that would be huge for the team it would be huge for the quarterback just the offensive in general and i'm excited about a lot of these names in next year's class uh one of my personal favorites is connor williams from texas he's a very good mover um and he's going to be one i'm going to look forward to watch this year you got mitch hyatt from clemson uh, mike mcglinchey who's one of the ones who returned he might have been the first offensive tackle off the board this year if he had not returned Orlando Brown, who's a, just a monstrous right tackle. And then my sleeper is uh, Chokora Okorafor from uh, Western Kentucky, who played left tackle for them this year, and just a 336-foot, six-pound ballerina. <laughs> He's kind of raw, <laughs> but, I mean, he, he can move. It's incredible. If you're a yeah. tape watcher, go put on Taylor Moten's tape because that's the only way you're going to find the Chokora tape uh, cut up. And watch the left tackle. I mean, he's raw, but he's such an athlete for his size with, like, huge arms and i i'm just i'm fascinated by this kid i i saw a mock draft today you know I've, he's been my best secret recently i've been like oh man this guy's the one to watch this guy's the one to watch i saw a mock draft today he was the fourth overall pick that's the first <laughs> time i've heard anybody talk about it but like this this is a good kid so i'm excited about next year's offensive tackle class and it is not stupid to take another one first round because you're helping that quarterback and you are setting the franchise up long-term cap wise controlling that salary of that really expensive position yeah no, I agree. Now, what what is maybe one of your positions that you would love to see him take? Well, besides offensive tackle, I, I am very much a uh, value position guy. So I would not be upset at all at taking another cornerback or taking another edge rusher. There are some defensive linemen and maybe some safeties that intrigue me next year. Derwin James, for one, you know, depending on where we pick, he's a freak athlete. Uh, we have a friend who we talk regularly with, uh, Scott, who is literally – obsessed with Derwin James. I think he wants to marry Derwin James. But I don't blame him. <laughs> Derwin James is a freak. I mean, he's one of the best safeties. He probably would have been the first safety taken in this year's class. But yeah, edge defender and cornerback. It's early, so we're going to see how the roster boils down. But you can never have enough young quality edge rushers or cornerbacks. For edge rusher, I mean, you got Barrett, who's probably going to leave not after this year, but the year after. I believe he was still an RFA this year. So, you know, he, he may walk soon. Uh, you know, we got to make a choice on Shane Ray, and I think he has to take a step up this year if he's going to get that fifth uh, fifth year option. You know, he's a good pass rusher, but a lot of it's clean up pass rush, and he needs to do a better job at setting the edge. So that's something to watch. And yeah. cornerback, even with Langley already, 
Uh, you got Tlaib, who's going to be older and had back injuries last year and has had a history of injuries before coming to Denver. And then Roby may hit the market. So it's not, it's not going to be a bad idea to load up on another cornerback. Yeah. And something people need to remember, like that fifth year option, it's, it's a great thing to have, but that doesn't mean that it's cheap either. No. You know, edge defender, especially, I mean, they, they take the, if I remember right, the top 10 or 15 players at the position and uh, average out the, the total. So, I mean, you're counting edge defenders. So that's Vaughn Miller. You know, his, his salary's in there. Um, by that point, you're probably going to have a Khalil Mack possibly in there. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe he won't have quite the money. You know, I think he's still got another year where maybe they don't pay him. But, but still, you know, it gets expensive. You know, cornerback, I, I think uh, Roby's going to cost something like $10 million for his fifth-year option. You know, most likely we have Tlaib off of there by now, by then because he'll be a little bit older and, and price getting a little bit more than what we want to pay. But yeah, so th- those are great things to have, but those players still have to prove that they deserve that fifth year option. And so, yeah, they're the positions of need and you, you can never have enough of edge defender, cornerback, offensive tackle. You know, th- these are key positions that you need more than one quality player at. Yeah. You need quality depth and, cheap quality depth. I mean, relatively cheap. And not only that, but they provide valuable trade chips down the line as well. I mean, if they turn out to be solid players, you can turn that player into a first round pick plus, you know, so that's, that's something that can be extremely valuable and can help you, you know, swing a trade maybe that for a player that you need or a couple picks. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what the, the, the Patriots were looking at this year. I mean, if they wanted to make a couple trades, there's a good chance they could have had like three first round picks. You know, if they, they wanted to trade uh, Jimmy G or uh, or Butler was the other one at cornerback. There was talk that a late first round pick was his value. So, yeah, you can get some great value for these guys and, and just see what they can bring. But like I said, you can never have too many. You know, that was what made our 2015 defense so great. You know, when you were three deep at cornerback where all three would be starting on most teams and two of them are all pro level, you know, that, that's huge. Edge defender, when you have DeMarcus Ware coming and he gets tired and you send in Shane Ray or, or uh, Shaq Barrett, you know, and teams are just going, what? you know, who are these guys? How do they keep coming at us like this? You know, you take out a starter and the backup comes in and is almost as good. That's that's impressive stuff. So that's how you keep that kind of 2015 defense going. Yep, and Elway so far has taken uh, one of the elite value positions first round every single draft so far besides 2013 when he took uh, – or maybe it was 2012. The year 2013, that he took Sly, yeah. The year that he took Sly, Sly Williams. Williams. Yep, yep, 2013. And, and even there, interior pass rusher because he was kind of known as that guy to get pressure in the middle. He was known for a quick first step. And unfortunately, the problem was with him, um, we had a coach that didn't really take advantage of that. He was more of a two-gap guy on the inside with a one-gap rusher. And he just wasn't working out well. And then, then, you know, moving him to nose tackle, he just he was asked again to kind of hold up a little bit and get a little more, you know, pressure. In 2015, he showed up well for us. Having Malik Jackson next to him helped a lot. But, well, yes, yes. Yeah. He had a lot more one-on-one opportunities than exactly than what most nose tackles get. But he still he still made some great plays for us and appreciated it, but his price tag compared to his position got a little too expensive. So, you know, th- there's other positions, you know, kind of like nose tackle. That's a position of need. Um, you know, we got, uh, I'd say, more rotational type guys right now um, compared to a, you know, 10-year starter at the position. Strong safety, everybody kind of forgets, uh, TJ Ward is up after this year for contract wise. And I think right now we have two great free safeties and one great strong safety in TJ Ward. You know, I think Justin Simmons, I think he's going to be a great free safety. Um, I'm kind of excited to see what he brings year two because we use a lot of three safety looks, but we don't really have anybody that I would say is a great fit to follow up after TJ Ward. Yeah, we'll see what Parks brings this year. Um, he, apparently, he's somebody that I've heard some excitement about. But that said, I mean, he was, was he a fifth-round pick, sixth-round pick? Seventh so, round. Parks was a seventh round? Yeah, he was a seventh round, man. Oh, man, great value. Almost, Good job, Parks. Yeah, no, I, and I, I like Parks. 
I just, I, I think he, I, I don't know if he'll develop into that full-time starter. I don't know. He's a great hitter. He made some amazing plays for us this last year. I mean, game changing, won us a game with his play. Not not trying to discredit him. I, I'm sorry, you know, if you're listening out there, but <laughs> he, he's a good player. I like having him, um, but I don't know if he's going to develop into that, that surefire starter that we really love having there. Worst case scenario is going to be a very good special teams player going forward. And he was taken right. in the sixth round. I'm looking it up now. It was the very sixth, end of the sixth oh, round. Okay. So. <laughs> there you go. Still, that's great value even for a special teams backup contributor. Yeah, exactly. And then the last position I think they may look at would be running back. I mean, probably not a round one value, kind of like inside linebacker, nose tackle. But it's definitely a need on the team the way I see it. I mean, you got C.J. Anderson. I believe he's a free agency. He's a free agent after this year along with Jamal Charles, both have severe injury questions. Can they stay healthy? Can they stay in proper shape to play? That's more for CJ than Jamal Charles, but I guess healthy is a type of shape. <laughs> and uh, Booker, you know, he didn't show very well last year, and I'm, I'm thinking he'll have a better role this year. I think he'll play a little better. But still, I think he's probably the type that's never going to be a 1A back. He's more of a 1B. Yeah. So they may be looking at running back again this yeah. point. Next year. And, and something to keep in mind, there are some great running backs next year again. You know, oh. we thought this was a great running back group. There, there's another one coming. Uh, Saquon Barkley. Freak. Uh, of, of Penn State. There's yeah. talk that he would have been the top running back in this draft if, he had, he, if he'd been able to come out. He might have been just because he's so well-rounded. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, you have Alabama producing another great running back in Scarborough. And Nick Chubb, he was the guy that kind of went back and forth. Um, has some injury history, but still – great player even coming back from his big time injury his uh, season ending knee injury he still averaged five yards carry and over a thousand yards his last year and then Darius Geis LSU what is up with all these I mean Alabama LSU oh my goodness producing all these great running backs but there was talk five that athletes, yeah five athletes. yeah they were talking that that Geis might have actually shown better than Fournette if you can believe that just freak athletes and, of course, you're going to have some other guys that are going to emerge um, as, as time goes through. Uh, maybe one of your Iowa boys, Wadley. Akram Wadley. Little, yeah. LaShawn, McC- little LaShawn McCoy. <laughs> so th- there's some some great running backs. Um, so if one falls to us, wherever we are in the draft, you know, it might be worth it. Yeah. You know, there, there's nothing better to help a young quarterback than to have a great run game. Amen. And that's that'll start with uh, the first pick we made this year. So hopefully we're pulling for Bulls. We're pulling for Walker. We, you know, we're given our best assessment of their skill set, you know, their combine numbers and their film. And, you know, we'll keep moving along. We got eight picks. We're two down and we got six to go. Next week we will touch in on our third round picks. We got our boy Carlos Henderson as well as our uh, kind of a surprise pick, but adding another player to the no-fly zone in Brendan Langley. So we'll touch on those next week, and I'm excited to do it. Oh, yeah. I, I found some amazing numbers for Carlos Henderson that I'm excited to dive into. This guy, I, I was excited before, and then I looked at some of his numbers. Man, <laughs> Broncos got a steal there. I, I think he's going to be a star for us. He's such a perfect third back or a third wide receiver for us, too, in the types of formations we want to run. Exactly. Did you see that one that I tweeted out uh, last week where it was uh, he had 48 missed tackles in 2016? which was 22 more than the next wide receiver. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen that one before. And oh. uh, yeah, he, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing. I mean, I, I have stats that show in the open field, he blew away the competition with how many times he'd break, break a tackle. Um, you know, he even had, you know, the most like two or more missed, missed tackles on plays where, you know, he would have a rate of when he had the ball in open field, 39.3% of his plays where he made two or more people miss. Oh my goodness. Gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, He's I don't so want to get, I don't want to give away too much for next week, <laughs> but yes, this guy, he is, he's a stud. Um, he's my favorite pick by far. So yeah, we'll dive into that. I'm excited to get into Langley a little bit and, and maybe see what else we can do. All right. Well, that will wrap up episode 14 of our draft focused huddle up podcast. We have closed out the draft and are now starting to, you know, look back and how these guys fit with the Broncos and the upcoming season, man. It's going to get here before you know it, but we're going to keep pumping out some content for you crazy listeners out there. 
Bronco fans, make sure you keep checking back in on Mile High Huddle for all your updates about training camp and rookie mini camp coming right up, and all the Bronco news. You can find Carl on Twitter at Carl Dumbler MHH and myself at Nick Kendall MHH, as well as find other Bronco articles on Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of Scout.com. You can follow the Huddle Up podcast by subscribing to us on iTunes and for Android users, Stitcher, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. You can also follow us on Twitter at My High Huddle and at Huddle Up underscore MHH. Again, please be sure to subscribe and rate us. For Carl Dummler, I'm Nick Kendall, wrapping up the 14th episode of the Huddle Up podcast, well, the Draft Focus Huddle Up podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week. Uh, tweet at us if you don't agree or you know just want to start a conversation. And we will see you guys next week. Go Broncos. Mile High Huddle.